The mystique of silent film star Rudolph Valentino is just as popular today as it was 60 years ago when he died. And there's one man who knows more about Rudolph Valentino than anyone else in the world. He's the president of the Rudolph Valentino Guild, and he's from London, England. His name is Mr. Leslie Flint. Leslie, how many members are there? in the worldwide Rudolph Valentino Guild? Well, when you ask me about members, uh, as members, there are many hundreds of members as such. Uh, mostly, I would call them associate members because since uh, all our activity is in London and they're living abroad in many instances, they're not able to attend the film shows that we run regularly when we show the Valentino pictures uh, in a small hall that I have attached to my house uh, and we run a, a movie once a month, a Valentino movie, that is, that I've been able to collect over many, many years. Uh, there are many, many people who are interested who write and ask for photographs or information or could they uh, obtain books appertaining to his life, and I'm able to advise them in some instances where they might be able to obtain such books because most of them are rare now. Uh, most were written in the 20s and early 30s. Uh, but we have a tremendous interest in Valentino, in England particularly, and of course, as indeed it is true to say, around the world. Uh, but the activities in London to do with Valentino are probably unique, inasmuch as having collected over many years most of the Valentino pictures, able to show them to a limited audience, that is, members and friends of members, uh, then the, it all spreads and enlarges, of course, and, of course, in London, we had a, a premiere of an old silent picture of Valentino's Blood and Sand, uh, which was um, attended by royalty. We had a royal premiere. It's an unheard of thing. They had a terrific turnout. They even had um, a big dinner after the show. Um, Princess Margaret was in attendance with Lord Snowden. It was an aid of charity. And it was a tremendous success. And the film ran for about two months. What is it about, excuse me, what is it about Rudolph Valentino that attracts people, even royalty? What is the mystique? Well, that's almost an impossible question to answer. There are so many different angles and aspects to it. Of course, one has to bear in mind that Valentino came at a very important aspect of time. Just after the First World War, uh, thousands and thousands of women throughout Europe, particularly, had lost their husbands or their sweethearts, and they were probably doomed in many instances to live a, well, a very unhappy sort of state of existence as old maids. And they saw this wonderful romantic human being who moved so gracefully, uh, who looked so wonderful, and appeared in magnificent costume. And also you have to bear in mind that the films were silent, and people's imagination uh, had to play a very important part. And, of course, the films, although they were silent, they were accompanied by big orchestras in the bigger theatres. I mean, an orchestra of 30 or 40 musicians would play mood music, you see. And, of course, this all added. Here was this wonderful human being, so attractive, so handsome, moved so beautifully, so gracefully, uh, that women really went to town. I mean, they really were taken... Uh, well, into such an extent of ecstasy uh, that he became world famous. You see, before Valentino, uh, the American hero was, with all due respect, a very nice, young, attractive, blonde, American type of boy who had no European background or influence. Uh, he wasn't able to make love. Uh, when he did, it was very ham-fisted. He was this man full of ardor, full of Latin attraction, and this remarkable aspect of personality that women just fell hook, line, and sinker. Is that why he was more attractive to women, but the men The didn't men like were him jealous. So much. You see, the whole tragedy, Paul Valentino had to suffer a great deal of the, uh, of the, this, because men were jealous of him. The girls would take their boyfriends to see Valentino in the shake, or whatever the film happened to be, <coughs> and the men were resentful. Uh, they thought, oh, my God, you know, I don't, don't look like that man up there. And the girls were swooning. And in consequence, a lot of them were, and the men, that is, were jealous. Yes. He had a great deal of success with women <coughs> on the screen. But in his private life, 
It was another story. <coughs> well, Valentino off the screen was entirely different to what he was on. He, one has to bear in mind that he came from Italy when he was 18 years of age. Uh, he didn't come as an immigrant. Uh, his family had a wonderful background. His mother was the daughter of a Parisian doctor. His father was uh, in the Italian cavalry, an officer. He had a very good background and upbringing. He spoke several languages fluently. He didn't come as an immigrant. He came with money. Uh, but, of course, he was young, and uh, his money went very quickly. And, indeed, it got to the point where he had to sleep in Central Park. He had no money uh, to rent a room, even, and his clothes were in a boarding house, and he couldn't afford to pay the rent, and they wouldn't let him have his clothes back. But eventually, fortunately for Valentino, uh, he did get a job as a dancing partner. There's one thing about him, you see, he, he had this natural grace, and he danced beautifully, and he was able to earn a living as a dancing partner. Indeed, he became very famous. He danced with two of America's most famous women dancers of the time. One was Joan Sawyer, and uh, they made quite a sensational hit. They danced at the Winter Garden in New York, and gradually he made his way down to Hollywood uh, because of uh, a man, an actor, called Norman Carey, whom he'd met previously. And Norman Carey said, you know, Rudy, you should be a great success in movies with your physique, your looks, and uh, I'll do everything I can to help you. And in consequence, gradually, he got into the movie industry. He played minor roles in the beginning. He played anything to earn enough to eat and so on. But the point is that Valentino's unique personality at that early period wasn't the kind of uh, personality that uh, appealed to the producers and the film industry. And they always looked upon um, Latins as dagos, usually played mm -hmm. by Mexicans or people uh, from across the border. And Valentino had this extraordinary dark good look about him that they could only see him as a villain. And, he play, and then until May Murray, who in her day was a very famous uh, actress in movies, uh, she had met Valentino in New York, and she danced with him, and she liked him. And this was during the First World War, when leading men were scarce. Uh, so she gave him the opportunity to be in two of her movies, uh, when he did not play the villain, played the second sort of male lead. And that sort of helped him tremendously. But the point comes, the great point comes, when he was discovered uh, to play Julio in the film of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. And now Valentino was dead right for the character. They had searched Hollywood, they searched New York for someone who was suitable to play this attractive young tango dancer from the Argentine. Because the film is Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse is set in the initial stages in the Argentine. And it was essential to have someone attractive, physically attractive, who could dance the tango and make a hit. And June Mathis, who'd written the uh, script for the film, she fought heaven and hell to get him for the role. Are there any locations left in Hollywood that are associated with Valentino and his film? Well, of course, the house that he bought roughly a year before he died, Falcon Lair is still there, more or less intact as it once was in the 20, late 20s, 1926, uh, owned by Doris Duke. Uh, but she will not allow anyone to enter the house. In fact, it's all boarded up. You can't even see inside the entrance because the gates are all boarded up, unfortunately. And is there a restaurant down the street? That was once his dressing room? That I do not know anything about. Uh, it's news to me if there is such a place. Leslie, there are rumors that Valentino did not die a natural death, that he was poisoned mm. by a mistress. Is there any truth to that? There's a lot of who he went on about Valentino, the way he died. And it's a very well-known fact that he had an ulcerated stomach. In fact, the last year of his life, he had a great deal of unpleasantness uh, due to this, and he didn't realize that he'd got Dudino ulcer. And it wasn't until he was in New York, he was rushed to the hospital and they operated. 
and it was too far gone. It, uh, things developed, and he died. There's no truth, as far as I know, the rumors that he was murdered or killed. Does anyone, <coughs> does anyone know who the mystery lady is who is said to place a wreath on his grave? Oh, I met the lady out here in Hollywood. You, you're talking about a woman called Dietra La Flamme. Uh, she, she was the woman in black. Yes. Uh, she had been a musician of violinist. And when she was very ill in hospital, when she was very young, uh, Valentino went to visit her in hospital and took her flowers. And they had a sort of thing uh, between them, that is a sort of code, that whichever one died first, they wouldn't forget, and they would place flowers on, his, uh, on the grave, you see. Now, she herself told me this. I cannot vouch for the genuineness of her story, but I have no reason to disbelieve her. Because Valentino was that kind of person. He was very generous and very kind to people. And he obviously felt sorry for this girl. And so it was just <coughs> kindness. It was a platonic relationship. <coughs> oh, yes. There's no doubt about that. I got to know Dita Le Flamme fairly well. And she used to run the Valentino Guild out here, Valentino Association. And she used to run movies occasionally when she could. In those days, it was difficult to get any of the Valentina pictures. Most people thought they'd been lost forever. In fact, uh, it's only latterly that some of the films have survived and come to light. And, of course, now Hollywood is taking more interest in its past, and they're trying to rescue what films are left. Uh, there are several Valentina pictures that have been lost forever, unfortunately, unless somewhere someone has a print. Do you know uh, the which, name? Um, Do you know the titles? One well, of the lost films, uh, okay, um, that one of the films most desired to find uh, is Beyond the Rocks, Gloria Swanson. Now, I got to know Gloria Swanson, and the first thing she ever asked me when I first met her, Oh, Mr. Flint, do you know where there is a print of the film I made with Valentino, Beyond the Rocks, for Paramount Pictures? And I said, No, Miss Swanson. I, too, have been trying to get a copy of that film. Anyway, she was very anxious to obtain it. As far as we know, <coughs> the only copy may exist in Russia. You know, Russia has the biggest archive of American silent pictures. Uh, it's an extraordinary thing. But if any American pictures of the silent era in particular that have been lost, which America doesn't possess, are obtainable in Russia. But Russia, unfortunately, will not play ball uh, I do know that they had some of the lost films. Uh, there's The Sainted Devil, A Sainted Devil, which Valentino made with Helen Adalji, uh, which was a very beautiful film in some respects. It went to pieces halfway through, but that's a personal objection that I have. But he was never more beautiful than he was. You see, he was very cleverly photographed. <coughs> and that film, unfortunately, seems to have disappeared. There was also the young Raja, of which I have about a third of the film, which was survived. I got that from Buenos Aires. They found a complete print of the film disintegrating in the cans. They saved what they could and very generously made a copy for me. But it's only about four reels of the original. Well, Valentino made about 33 films in his <coughs> career, so... Well, if you count the very early ones, the ones that before he was famous, uh, maybe round about 23 or 4. Uh, but you see, from the Four Horsemen onwards, that's when it all began. That's when the hysteria, if you want to use that kind of expression about Valentino, started. And it's never diminished. Well, what kind of influence did his wife, Natasha Rambova, have over his career? Was it well, a good I think, influence? I think in some respects he owed a great deal to Natasha. Uh, and he always gave the woman full credit. Uh, she was a very talented girl. She'd had a beautiful education. She became a, 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 a ballet dancer with Theodore Koslov with his ballet. She then went into movies and de designed sets, costumes. <coughs> and so uh, she had a great influence upon Valentino. And he fell madly in love with her. She always said she never wanted to be married anyway. And she certainly didn't want to have children. She was an ambitious lady with a career ahead of her. But she liked Valentino. She was attracted to him. Uh, when uh, they did, uh, Valentino did a film with Nazimova, 
uh, he was on one to have Tamiyo. And Natasha Rambava was working with Nazumova at the old Metro studios. And she helped Valentino with his hair because in the early scenes, uh, Valentino as Armand uh, came from the country. He was a country boy in the early sequence. And then he becomes sophisticated. And she helped to fluff his hair up. Well, he always had very sleek black hair. And he didn't like the idea of his hair being messed up. But anyway, she insisted. Anyway, they became very good friends. Uh, and you asked me earlier uh, about any places where Valentino lived. The actual bungalow where Valentino lived for roughly a year with Natasha, when they were very much in love, presumably, still exists. It's on Sunset Boulevard. It's now two, two small shops. It's still there, that little bungalow where his love developed with Natasha. Is there a plaque on the building <coughs> anywhere you showing where it is? No, love it. Mm -hmm. There's no such <laughs> No, unfortunately about this town, I shouldn't say it because I love Hollywood. Uh, but this, I shouldn't say perhaps certain things I feel very impressed to say. It has little or no respect for its past. And um, that that bungalow is still there where Valentino caught it, the Tasha Rambo. It's now two small shops. What kind of shops? So what, what's the address? <coughs> I don't know what the shops are now. Because uh, I haven't it had made a point of going. When I first discovered the bungalow was still there, I did go and just have a look, you know. And it was very amusing to me because at the back of these two shops, which was the bungalow, <coughs> it was the yard. And they both had a great interest in buying old furniture and redecorating it. And Valentino and Natasha would spend Sunday mornings or afternoons repainting furniture and uh, Natasha had this bizarre sort of uh, very sort of creative aspect about everything everything had to be very glamorous and she'd do these extraordinary things probably that was one of the most happiest year of his life what when other the two of them were struggling because you see Valentino had fallen out with Paramount Pictures and he was the first actor ever in Hollywood to have the strength of character to turn around to the studios and said, well, <coughs> I'm not going to make these cheap, shoddy pictures. You see, Paramount was turfing out as many Valentino pictures as they could in as short a possible time to get the money in at the box office. They weren't interested in the quality of the film. Valentino was the great draw at the box office. So what did they do? They got him to make as many as four pictures of the year. They rushed him through, and a load of it, a lot of it was was trash. There's a recent revival of a film called <coughs> The Eagle. <coughs> well, that film, The Eagle, was when he left, eventually, of course, Paramount. Uh, I just cap back a little bit because after Valentino left Paramount. He and Natasha did a tour of the United States dancing on the stage to earn a living. Valentino was not by uh, the fact that he had broken his contract, was not allowed to appear in any movies for any other organization. So Valentino and Natasha danced throughout the United States to make some money so they could live. He was the first actor who had the guts to turn around to the studios. I'm not going to make these cheap, shoddy pictures. I want the kind of pictures that I know I can give credit to, uh, which will also be a credit to your studio. And she, with him, backing him, they, he left the studio. So anyway, so eventually Paramount, because they had thousands and thousands and thousands of letters demanding Valentino, uh, they gave him a new contract. He was off the screen for 18 months, uh, a much increased salary, of course. And then he started to make first-class pictures. Uh, most made, uh, two of the two of them were made at the Astoria Studios in New York City. He did Miss of a Care, which is a big, spectacular, glamorous picture costume, which of course fitted him beautifully, and he gave an interesting and exciting performance. And then, uh, his contract was finished, and then Joseph Skink invited him to work for United Artists, that is Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks, Charles Chapman, which was in those days the apex of the industry. If you were with United Artists, you really were the top, you see. And uh, Joseph Skink, um, 
eventually got Valentino into the United Artists, and he made The Eagle and The Son of the Sheik. They were the last two films that he ever made, you see. Uh, the Eagle was a Russian thing. Uh, it was a t a Valentino played it with tongue-in-cheek. He didn't play it with a great seriousness, because actually, if you've seen the film, you'll realize that in a way, Valentino had this strange sense of humor. He was sending himself up, and he admitted that later. It was a romantic picture with beautiful Vilma Bankett, whom uh, Skank had brought over, oh, Goldwyn, rather, Sam Goldwyn, had brought over from Hungary. And she'd appeared in two other films, she sang gold. And she was the leading lady in Valentino's last two pictures. And she um, didn't speak very much English, actually. But Valentino had this dry sense of humor, and he really sent himself up in the nicest possible way. And of course, he looked magnificent in these Russian costumes, you see. Yes. And it was a sort of um, a film with a certain amount of action, too, which was popular at that period of time with movies. In fact, uh, he got very good notices for the film. And then he did The Son of Sheik. Now, Valentino was never happy about The Sheik. He admits that it gave him his great success because everybody referred to him more or less as The Sheik and it became a sort of thing uh, people used to talk about uh, a boyfriend, oh, well, he's a bit of a sheik, you know, and all that. It was a sort of, became a sort of a fun thing uh, in, in language among people of that period. Uh, he's a bit of a sheik, you see. That's, but, the, that's the way most people remember yeah, it. Yeah, well, of course, the point is that he hated the picture. Uh, but, you see, that was the first film he made for Paramount. They were looking for someone who would play the sheik because the book itself had been a great bestseller, worldwide bestseller. And Valentino had left Petro, and he'd asked Metro for a raise in salary, and they wouldn't give it to him, and he left. And then he went into Paramount, did the shake, and of course it was sensational success. Talkies were coming about that time. And they came a bit later. And how do you think that would have changed his career had he lived? Well, it's difficult to say. I think Valentino could have been a success, like Garbo. Now, Garbo's silent pictures, uh, as you well know, she was so beautiful and she was very impressive. And everybody was worried about whether Garbo, with her strong, thick accent, could be a success. Mm -hmm. But actually, she was a success. Mm -hmm. And um, she did Anna Christie, as you know, uh, with a thick accent. But it fitted the character. But of course, Valentino, you must remember this, that Valentino was a very well educated man. He spoke four languages fluently. If you were to see some of the letters that he has written, which I have got, you would be amazed that here was a man, an Italian, who could write such beautiful, fluent English, and there's no doubt he spoke very well, with a slight, very slight accent, which was added. He hadn't got a big voice. It was rather a deep voice, but throaty voice in a kind of way, which would have fitted his personality. You know you made a gramophone record? No, no. <coughs> well. Where is it? I have it. <laughs> uh, but the point is that way back in 1923, as a joke, he made a record. Gramophone, the old 78 reps per second. Yeah. Uh, like you or I might make in the early days when we had um, the tapes, you know, make right. the tapes. And everyone was shocked when they first hear themselves on tape, you see. But anyway, he made this record. On one side, he sings El Valicario in Spanish, which he spoke fluently. And on the other side, in English, he sings one of the Indian love lyrics, a Kashmiri song. And I'm not saying I would be the last person to say he had a wonderful voice. But you know that it was done for fun. And um, he... Uh, had quite a voice, yes. and with a little help, you know, he could have developed in that direction, too. He would not have been an operatic singer, but certainly when you listen to some of the pop singers today, he was a bloody sight better than they are. <laughs> I mean, let's face it. Leslie, over the years, you have come to know members of the Valentino family, and you've also visited, visited his birthplace. Yes, I've been... Uh, uh, I made a, a visit to Valentino's birthplace. Which is? Uh, which is in southern Italy. And uh, I had a reception by the mayor of the town. 
because you know they erected a statue to Valentina in Castellanetta, where he was born, and uh, we took a big wreath there and put outside the house where he was born, which is still intact, and uh, the mayor gave us a reception. Uh, you see, perhaps I shouldn't say this, uh, Castellanetta, like a little southern Italian a small town or large village is an unknown quantity in the world. And uh, I suppose to get publicity because uh, they wanted to get the place well known. Uh, I'm not saying they did this to get publicity, but there's no doubt uh, that it did help that Valentina was born there, you see. So we took, we went there on a pilgrimage, if you like, and I met some of the people there who way back in the earlier years had known the Valentino family. You see, Valentino's family were highly respected. I mean, this was more or less, I shouldn't say this, but it's true, a poverty-stricken place in southern Italy, way back at the turn of the century. Mostly, I shouldn't say peasants, but uneducated. But Valentino's father had been a cavalry officer. His mother had been the daughter of a Persian doctor. And they spoke French as well as Italian, and they were a little bit upper class, you know, and uh, his father did a great deal for the people of the village, and he also did a great deal for where the animals were concerned, because he was also a doctor, you see. Uh, no, we went there, and out here in Hollywood, when Valentino died, his brother came out here to see to the estate, and they had a big fight in the court with George Ullman, who was the manager of Valentino. And they saved what they could, but Valentino was very much inclined to spend more than he earned. Let he was a very extravagant young man. You know more about Rudolf Valentino than anyone else in the world. Well, I wouldn't say that, but I know a lot. The little-known facts that people don't know, what else do you know about him that no one else really knows? Well, you see, there's been such a lot of nonsense written about the poor man. You know, when a person's dead, they can say what they like and write what they like, and nobody can contest it or sue them. Well, there have been two movies about him. <coughs> oh, well, they were a load of junk. <laughs> I mean, let's face it. I mean, those movies had no connection with the reality of the man at all. There was the sort of, there was the backbone, if you like, but the flesh on the thing was nothing like Valentina. I mean, it's pitiful, really. You see, Valentina was no saint who is. He was a very wonderful human being in many respects, very kind, very warm, had a terrible temper, like a lot of Italians, I suppose. Uh, but he had no illusions about himself. If he had the illusions at all, it was about women. What would you uh, like? You see, he believed in people, he had faith in people. Natasha let him down, his wife. Uh, when she realized that um, she wasn't really going to make any real headway because uh, Valentina was in the position to do a great deal for her. But then again, you see, a lot of things are not generally known. When Valentino signed the contract with United Artists, he had to sign a contract that said, under no circumstances was Mrs. Valentino, Natasha Rambova, to be allowed on the set. She had made herself so disliked in the film industry that nobody wanted to have anything whatever to do with the lady. Well, Valentino had this wonderful contract. So he knew that he had to sign it if he wanted to carry on in movies and earn a limit. So he signed it. From that moment onwards, she didn't want to know him. And then, indeed, what did he do to pacify her? He financed her own production. She made a film called What Price Beauty. It, all the money came out of Valentina's pocket, money that he could ill afford at that time. And of course, the film was an absolute disaster. And uh, then she left him. And I have pictures of him at the railway station in Los Angeles, uh, where he's, for the sake of the press, kissing her goodbye and all that. <coughs> but he knew that he'd lost her. And from that moment onwards, and from that moment only onwards, did he play the field. Up to that moment, he was an adoring husband, worshipped woman. And after she left him, the Polo Negri thing started up. Well, Polo Negri was sniffing at the box office. 
je vous say this, this was. And she saw publicity for herself by getting teamed up with Valentino. Leslie, you have the largest collection of Valentino memorabilia in the world. Is there anything you don't have that you're trying to find? Well, I suppose in a way, yes. The things that I most would like to possess, not just for my own satisfaction, that I might be able to present to other people so that they can see the variety of roles and characters that Valentino played, I'd like to get the missing films, especially the one that Gloria Swanson so much wanted. And of course there are one, there are three missing films, major films, and they're the things I would most What are the like. titles of the three missing films? Well, there's um, Beyond the Rocks, yes. The Young Raja, which I've got a, a bit of it there, and of course The Sainted Devil. Yes. They're the three. Leslie Flint, thank you very much. It's a pleasure.